Tako ustanoviteljico legendarnega arhiva Her Story Archives in v New Yorku, avtorico dela Restricted Country in še mnogo kaj. Tako da bom kar predala besedo o voditeljici Urški strne in vam želim prijeten večer. Hvala. Let's start with history. Tatjana mentioned the history archive and uh, it's such an important part of your life and part of our lives that I have to ask you the first very basic question. What is lesbian history and why do we need to preserve it? Ooh, it might be basic but it's huge and profound. You're stopping us right at the top. But, um, I just want to thank uh, everyone who brought me here. I want to thank you all for coming. I, I've already had, we went out to dinner last night, and we've all, it's already been a profound experience in our life. My dear, dear partner, Diane Otto, without whom I could not make these journeys, and they're physical journeys, psychic journeys, political journeys, so she makes it all possible. Um, I want to start, I was saying, last night at dinner, we got into an archaeological conversation. I was Tatiana, yes. So I said, how I was going to start with the history was that what you are looking at is a lesbian archaeological dig. That's me. <laughs> because if you go through my head, as I will, you will have all the layers, at least, I'm 74 now, and I came out in 1958. So while New York lesbian history history is in this head as you go down and down. And if you get down to the very first sediment, you know, that layer that takes everything in, that was called my freak period. You know, like you have the Pale Paleozoic. Well, mine was the freak period, which became the queer period, which became the femme period, which became um, none of these getting lost, but all shoring each other up and all seeping through all the time. So in a way I'm saying when lesbian history is, it's living our histories. And for us, it's living a history, and I, I wanted to read a little, little section of that. Um, living our histories as deviant women, if I, with an emphasis both on woman and deviant. In other words, for me, because of my histories, I need my queer self, I need my feminist self, I need my lesbian self, I need my femme self. And those histories all happen at the same time, but they all don't happen in the same way. And in fact, sometimes they're in deep conflict with each other. Now, why I started the archives, and this is is because I came out, as if you've read my work, and my friends in New York all went, oh, Joe, not again, you know, because in the late 1950s, in working class butch femme bars of New York City. And in those bars were already generations of women going back to, so I, would, I was a young girl, young woman, 18, 17, and I was meeting women who were already in their 50s. So they were already going back into the early 20th century. And what I saw in those bars of the courage of these women, of their persistence, of their poverty, of their imagination, of their questioning of gender positioning in the 1950s, stayed with me as I, as I watched gay liberation come into those bars, as I watched lesbian feminism come into those bars, and I also watched some of those women be rejected by the new age of the 70s. Is this being clear? Am I being clear? Mm -hmm. You can interrupt me at any time and say, what did you say? <laughs> Um, so for me, I wanted an archives, which is a very formal name, to say thank you. There's another piece. 
and maybe afterwards I'll read some of the things <coughs> that I have written about Esther, a, a woman who took me on a lesbian ride of passage. Now here's what I mean, that we change the concept of history, because you know what, for me, was the most historical moment, and I'm always talking to you, Krishna, but I'm also talking to so, is when, this is a sexual act I'm going to speak of, okay? <laughs> and they usually are not part of history telling. And if I, my work means anything, it is that how our bodies are touched, as much as when we desire that touch as when we don't, it's a profound part of national histories. So I write about Esther, the first time a woman put pillows under my buttocks, Is this, so she could reach me more easily with her mouth. <coughs> so you can decide for yourself, as women and others have been doing all my years, whether my contributions are worthwhile or not. But I felt that rite of passage that lesbian rite of passage, how we teach each other to find our places of want, was a historical moment. Esther was a Puerto Rican woman who had come here as a gay refugee, we would have said. Um, all the comings together of national history. So, what does lesbian history mean? It means, how do we say thank you to that which gave us the gift of touch? How do we remember those who didn't survive the freedoms that we have now, some of us? It means, where are the crossing over points of national histories and sexual histories? Lesbian history is about how women who were undomesticated, that's the word I know the word, um, survived societies who so much had their script written for them. I think the world needs lesbian history. And when I use the word lesbian, to me it's an all-inclusive word, okay, just like to me the word queer is, and I know this is all. But lesbian is big enough to me, bisexual, it's big enough for me to me. Transgendered women who start their lives as lesbians and change in the way. It's, so am I answering your question? Yes. You are. And you, what I want you to think, I'm talking about my history, but you, with all your rich history, that's, it, my words need to be translated more, in more ways than from English to um, Slovene, but also into history into what it means in your history in relation to so much that has changed and perhaps some that has stayed the same. Thank you so much. Oh. Um, I wanted to ask you because we were in the process of translating your book, Restricted Country, um, as, as an important part of the history that we want to share with, with uh, young and, and, and older lesbians here, and we believe that it's very important that we present uh, affordable books, uh, historical books, to uh, very um, marginalized group of women who cannot afford expensive literature, who cannot afford many things. Um, and we wanted to translate your words, and we we're trying to do our best with what we have. And yet, on the other hand, and this is connected a little bit to with history and archiving things, um, we started our own archive. Uh, our colleague, Natasha Vilconia, runs it. And she said, okay, this, this struggle for, for our rights is like a long march through the margins, and we're trying our best. So we have a publishing house, we establish archive and everything. And then we have the critique of it. We have new generations coming to the scene saying, yes, but we want to be integrated, we don't need this. And we're trying to say, okay, we're doing it not just for us, but 
for everybody else who comes. So you will have some history to preserve, but because otherwise you'll have to wait and you'll have to depend on the kindness of strangers. Okay. And, and I wanted to ask you, because you did this great work of establishing this archive, this cult <coughs> archive, we, we all looked up to what you did and we said, we want to have this as well. We want to preserve our history. How, how do you handle the, either the critique like that, we don't need that, we don't want that, we want to be integrated, on one hand, and you know, what is there to, to do? You know, in one sense, for us, it was easier because we started the archives in 1974. So, people couldn't say, women couldn't say, well, why are you doing this where, you know, we don't need it anymore because there wasn't, it was needed, and in my head it's always needed. So, but you're raising merely also, I think, an issue of intergenerational conversation. And the first thing I want to say, I was so, first, thank you uh, to Tatiana and yourself and Natasha for translating my work, because there is no greater gift, I said this the other night, that a writer can have than to live in another history. And um, that you took this on, the amazing thing, there's been no money involved in any of this. That by itself, is revolutionary in these times. The, no, it, it's all done on the generosity and caring of women for women. And, but how can I say? I'm someone who grew up on the margins. And I have found them the source of all my work in a way. And I have written. I don't want younger women to have endured some of the things that I've written about, like the bathroom line and the intrusions into our private life and the beatings on the street. And I don't want younger women to endure that. But I did and I learned. I distrust the center of things, particularly when the center occupies a national position. So at 74, I ask questions about why are we begin, why, what makes us respectable now, and what is the trade-off? There's a very famous African American poet who we think is gay now, Langston Hughes, and he wrote a very famous poem called "Ask Your Mama," and it's about the cultural trade-offs that African American artists did in order to get any recognition at all. And he ends up saying they risk their whole selves, in a way. So what I would, first of all, I was so impressed when I was corresponding with Tatania, and, and you were saying that the publishing company has its own lesbian sort of, you know, part to it. And that reminded me of what, you know, all those lesbian publishing houses in America in the 70s, it was daughters, none of them survived. And how lucky and how wonderful. And I, what you must do is keep on doing what you're doing. This is my humble opinion, okay? No matter what the critique is, to keep on doing, because your critique of the larger society is as valid as the oppositional critique. There'll come a time, I believe, when those who don't understand will understand. When they'll write something that is unacceptable, or they'll take a position that throws them back to the margins. And there can't be too many. There can't be too many sources of preservation and encouragement of the lesbian voice. You know, so, um, but really, this kind of questioning is coming in many ways from young people, and maybe it's something we can talk about more. Um, my, my way of living my life has just, has been to be as, how can I say? To be as reflective about what I think I know from my life, to listen to new lives, which 
younger lives, to listen, because what they're historically experiencing is different, to keep trying to translate what seems, you know, translate the dreams and the what we thought are our insights from one time to another. Uh, and maybe have a conversation. This, this, I may be wrong, and you have to tell me. But I think this is a myth that the margins don't exist anymore. That they, that the, um, and I, again, it's your, I can't speak for what I don't know. Yeah. Um, so this very same people who critique now and may at one point say thank you. And all I can say is don't be demoralized. Don't question yourself into a kind of paralysis, you know. But keep going ahead doing what you're doing. Uh, and certainly an archives preserves everything that results. It preserves the margin, it preserves what moves to the center. And then it sets up a place, because none, none of us know where the story will end. But the archives will preserve that place where the, the narrative can work itself out. So I know this really, you just have to say what you believe as, and, and trust it. You mentioned that in a way it's a question of different generations. And, and I would just like to add, Sometimes it's a question of, of different politics yes. that come into the movement. Yes. And, and now we've we, we witnessed, and you probably witnessed, the change of the movement, um, how it changed, how it transformed, and it's much more um, uh, diverse now, which is good, and, but it's, it's full of very different fractions of different ideas, and we, we don't have just the left radicals or the progressives, we have liberal, uh, liberals, and we even have homosexual conservatives. Absolutely. And we somehow we have to coexist in this in this fishing bowl called our lives. And and I was wondering, you you worked so hard on so many progressive issues. You you marched very 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 far, uh, not just from Selma to Montgomery. But also for gay rights, for lesbian rights, for everything. Do you sometimes, when you look at the situation, the political situation, these different struggles that are going on in, in the movement, do you think, okay, what is going on? I, is my voice heard? Have they, have they learned nothing from what we, we've done? Don't they? Some of them, um, aren't they aware of the dangers of certain things that they're doing? And doesn't it make you wonder sometimes, how can, it's a legitimate position of course, but how can somebody become a conservative and work against their brothers and sisters? Does, does, it, not, does it make you bitter? Does it discourage you? But you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, particularly what's happening in America now, where more and more uh, gay people are, be are moving to the right. Um, or, how can I, okay, I, I have another group of people in mind as well, but um, let me just, it, no, it doesn't make, I can separate out, I've had a lifelong politic, and part of that has been all my work with lesbian history. And that politic has been informed as I've gotten older. But I see what is, I feel a great danger in the sense, but this is a danger that goes beyond us being queer together. It's the danger of the rising right. It's the danger of nationalism. It's the danger of fanatical uh, national identities. And what I used to think, I was, I did see this once, I remember on a gay beach in Brooklyn, this Hall, maybe in 1959, saying, oh, all gay people are socialists. Now I realize that has a different ring here, 
But I was like, all gay people are socialists, they have to be. And I look back at that young person. So you know what it means? It means our sexual histories do not necessarily give us a politic of inclusion or great human dignity, as I thought they would. It means that we are part of this human mass that can be a very dangerous force. I am not someone who thinks gay marriage should be at the heart of our struggles. I am not someone who thinks it's wonderful that American gay people can serve in the army. I call this a policy of deprivation. If the state says no, 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 long enough, people say yes, yes, yes. And then all of a sudden they look up and what did they say yes to? Well, becoming part of a traditional ceremony and ritual that has been based on the enslavement of women for so many years. And I really don't think gay people getting married would change it. I think just the opposite. I think the institution of marriage changes gay people. But not but, that's what I believe. I also don't believe that us serving in any national army, when I do not believe in war, is, no, is to our uh, strengthens, says that we're free. When you come out of a state of deprivation, sometimes you just, so there's two politics. There's the politic of deprivation that makes you say yes, yes to things that you really don't want, but somehow you've been so hungry for that taste. But then there's the other politic, and this is the one you're talking about. The politic that sometimes gay people, men and women and others, choose to be fascists. Sometimes now, they choose their class positioning over anything. Sometimes now, they are racists. So, yes, uh, but I'm not, it, it's not bitter that, I'm not bitter because of me, I'm not, my life has been my life, and that's one thing I just want to say. Take your deep beliefs, the beliefs that give you life, that include, that, that expand human dignity, and hold on to them and live them, and all the terrors that are happening, just follow, just somehow try to keep as close to them as you can. Because like at 74, or what I, I can say, I've tried my hardest to keep alive that which connected me in the way, in the way I needed to be connected to other human beings. Because they really, the right or the bitterness would come if I gave up too early. If I had, I'd never stop. And I would like to say, for those of you who have a vision, you just, you have to be, you have to live with yourself. Keep being yourself. Bitterness, I have nothing to be bitter about. Am I sad? Am I frightened? For all of us, if the right comes to more and more power, if economic rationalism continues, so none of us have a place to live. If, I mean, in all our different countries, this is all happening in different ways, right? Um, I believe being queer taught me certain things. It hasn't always stayed the same, and that's good, because I'm a living person. But I do believe in the dignity, I do believe in the dignity of touch. And I've learned, I've grown up in a community that has paid the highest price for it. Men and women, I've seen generations of men die. I have seen women be straight, gay, because they desire to be touched in a certain way. Um, no, I won't ever, I don't feel bitter. I worry for the, I worry, I worry for us. I worry for the next generation. Thank you. I have my own plan. <laughs> I wanted to ask you because you said you said your queer life taught you so many things, and the, and being on the margins 
sometimes enables a person to see things from a different perspective. It offers a clearer view. Uh, some people don't use it, some people do use it. And I was thinking about, you know, with, with this new um, balance of politics in, in the movement, sometimes it looks like the more conservative or the more liberal politics are kind of eating everything up. You said you don't believe that the, the question of gay marriage should be the central, and sometimes it looks like it, it ate everything up. There's nothing but marriage, nothing but one ceremony that ate everything up. Our culture, um, our communities, everything. It's it's as if the whole the whole community was only about how to get married. Jobs were discriminated against. There's violence. There's our cultural production. Where what do we make? How how do we present it to the world? And and sometimes you look at everything and you say, yes, but those politics not only they eat all the space for discussion and give a false picture of what is important for a community, but it also eats up this progressive potential that we have in our position to show to the world what is it that we can give from our perspective to the world that will change the world for the better, change the policies and, and politics of the world. Something that the movement had at the, at the beginnings when, when it said, we don't want marriage, we want to abolish our marriage. These are not, this is a serious conversation. <laughs> 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 Let's go back to the floor. <laughs> Um, it's a great hope that I can answer these questions, <laughs> and I think soon we'll, we'll, let, we'll turn it off. But I, you know what comes to my mind, and this is my knowledge, I, I, um, when I spoke, when we were in Belgrade three years ago, and I met Mishka for the first time, and she brought me this book. And this image here, um, 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 Leslie is defending their territory after it had been firebombed became for me my icon of the 21st century. And then I went online and I was seeing all the cultural work that's being done on me and Natasha. And so that's my answer. My answer is, it hasn't eaten everything up because you haven't stopped. I cannot stress enough, if my words have any meaning, your resistance your resistance to depression, how important that is, your resistance to feeling washed away, if those of you who share these political things, I'm not assuming everybody does, but um, this image of a tired persistence and the creation of new cultural work. And also, I just met Natasha who's running for mayor, there's new life. There's new life always. So, is that an yeah. 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 And I must say, my opinions are just mine. <laughs> um, but, you know, we may have to let go of some really long held, and I don't know if you felt them in this country, in this culture, but you know that um, being queer means a whole world of things being queer doesn't. And we may have to look for allies and coalitions in different ways, in, in different, and going, you know, the feminist beliefs. I think feminism, young people, I'll always say, well, young, I've been interviewed and they'll say, but young people say now that feminism isn't important. And I just laugh, because to me, that's like saying we don't need oxygen, you know, of course. <laughs> yeah. but, but everybody will come to it in their own way. And we, I just, with, there has to be a persistence of cultural production, of political, political maneuvering, political play. We are always very good at play, and I think play is still one of the most subversive things. Um, so, but all these scary times when we are at war every moment of our lives, how do you be queer in constant war? Can I read a poem? 
It's not my poem, but I have been, as I go around, I carry with me voices. Um, and this is a poem by an American lesbian poet called Muriel Rockheiser. And this is a poem she read, wrote, I'm sorry, uh, in 1968, and it's simply called Poem. I lived in the first century of world wars. Most mornings I would be more or less insane. The newspapers would arrive with their careless stories. The news would pour out of various devices interrupted by attempts to sell products to the unseen. I would call my friends on other devices. They would be more or less mad for similar reasons. Slowly I would get pen and paper, make my poems for others unseen and unborn. In the day I would be reminded of those men and women brave, setting up signals across vast distances, considering a nameless way of living, of almost unimagined values. As the lights darkened, as the lights of night brightened, we would try to imagine them, try to find each other, to construct peace, to make love, to reconcile waking with sleeping, ourselves with each other, to reach the limits of ourselves, to reach beyond ourselves, to let go the means to wait. I lived in the first century of these wars. And when I'm sitting here and looking out and I'm seeing, I said, I, I'm seeing, make my poems for others unseen and unborn. And I'm seeing you reach across vast distances. I live in Australia now. Let me tell you, that's a vast distance. <laughs> the questions you're asking, we have to find each other and give that hopeful persistence. And you know, we have to because, because, we, because we, we want to be alive and we want others to have the right to life, which is where our battles for me must lie now. But, so that's that I wanted to share yes, a poem yes. about. I was speaking to a young person and she said to me, but Joan, I've only lived in a time of war. So you must take my words for what you can, but you will have to find your own words. You will have, I'm speaking to, you know, young men. <laughs> you will have to find your way to reach each other, to find each other, and refuse the legacy that's growing around us, reaching up to our ears at this time. I'm talking about reaching our sisters, another very short question, but it's, it's, it's multiple. Okay, I know I talk a lot. No, 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 it's the depth, the profundity of what you ask. So, why do we love Butch women? Oh, that! In all their variety. <laughs> oh, we've got to read it. Well, maybe that's and then we can open it up for conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, this is very hot. Um, it's getting hot. Um, perhaps I'll, I'll speak for myself. Um, the original, it was a, a kind of, um, first of all, I was a kind of lesbian, and I'm, there are many kinds of lesbians, okay, so that's the first thing, and I'm just one kind, who did not want, really, to um, have relationships with women who were exactly like myself, okay? There was some theorizing in the early 70s about what was called the mirror image, and it was wonderful, that, this may make me a less nice person, but it, it was about it's wonderful to be a lesbian because the woman in the mirror is yourself. You're looking at someone and you look just like each other. And I said, okay, well, no, I don't want to. I don't want to be with a woman who's just like me. I want difference. I want 
difference in competencies, I want difference in taking on of life, I like difference within the one gender. I like different, perhaps, genders within the one gender, if I could put it that way. And then, I can't, you can't, ex I mean, all I knew was the women who weren't, okay, I'm going to get really, I'm, I can be the personification of tits and ass. <laughs> I have big breasts and I have a big ass. Okay? I needed a lover who's not frightened of those things. <laughs> I needed a lover who felt comfortable yes. with my need. But it wasn't a need that would follow her through the streets. You know, it wasn't a stalking need. It was just when I was ready. Um, it was a huge want, and it was wonderful to find women who delighted in and were frightened of taking on that want, and then I had my ways of of returning. <laughs> gift for gift. <laughs> so, uh, but I have to say, and then I, maybe I'll read that another piece. In my life, I. I because, you know, I've been attacked a lot for this butch feminist stuff, and, and one thing I want to make clear, I never said in my writings there's only one way to be a lesbian, and that's to be butch femme. I never said that. It was just talking for me, and a historical community also. But I have um, made love to feminine women. I've made love to radical socialist uh, feminists. <laughs> 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 <Yes>. <laughs> that's another story. But, um, <laughs> I'm dying to death. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm dying. So I'm uh, anyway, so I guess uh, it was, it was, they met me adventure for adventure, but they did it differently. And, and the women I met, I mean, it wasn't always easy going, and there are broken hearts and things like that, but um, so that, that's all enough for Okay, so feel free to join us in conversation if you have any questions or comments or if you if there is anything anything at all, any topic that you'd like to open. Because I talked with Joan and she said and I said, is there something you don't want to talk about? And she said, nothing at all. You know, bring it on, ask me anything you want, open any topic you want. So if if you'd like to join us. I think Joe would be very, very happy, and I would be very happy as well. And you don't have to agree if there's something I've said that you would like to speak against, or to please, please. You can get to hold the mic. Okay, go ahead. My entry on, because it's more ready. Anyone know? Yeah. Okay, you can you can join us at, at any point. But the other more we saw that connection. So, Mrs. Then I can do it. Oh, there's a question. I have a question. <laughs> okay, I just have a short question. You mentioned that people are closing in to their class now within the movement. They are closing in within their class. Ah, yes. yes. And then I mean, I just saw a very short uh, video from your presentation in Belgrade. There you said that. Um, Actually, when you were in New York, you were trying to organize or join women who were actually at the bottom of the society, uh, like clerks or uh, cleaning women, and so uh, and uh, right. So I found it really interesting that you kind of that, I don't I don't know if you live in that sort of class <laughs> in New York, but it was very interesting to try to to connect women, which didn't have actually any other time or they were like sort of slaves to the system. So I found it really yes. great. I, I, I'm not quite... I know that I wrote in, in, in my pieces, in the working class bars I went to, they were women from working class lives, you know, as I was too. Um, so they were taxi drivers, they were what we called stock clerks, they were out of work women, they were passing women, they were, you know, and um, and that's how I live my life. I mean, it's it's many like what the the principles of the archives are really principles of accessibility that are not based on uh, credentials, 
Do you know what I mean? Like many archives, you have to be uh, an academic or you have to, and so the Lesbian University Archives is open to all and there's all these things. But if, so I, I, I'm trying to think that's perhaps what you heard. Uh, um, uh, yes, because uh, what I find today is uh, this is exactly my experience that people are really uh, socializing uh, within the LGBT community according to the money. And so they are, I mean, if I have this amount of money, I will do these activities and then I will socialize with people with this amount of money. And then in the end, um, all the sort of sociability and, or the sort of thinking is gone. So you don't, you don't have anybody to talk with. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. Yes. So, and that's... No, I, I think, I just came from New York and um, I never thought I'd say this in my life because I was born in the Bronx, you know, and if you know, to uh, sing to a mother who worked her whole life, and I started working when I was 13, and, but I'll never go back to New York again. Because what I saw on the streets, both horizontally on the actual street, the homeless, in a way I haven't seen in 30 years, and the vertical gated communities advertising apartments literally for $17 million on the same street. Um, streets that were falling into disrepair. I saw a subservient class of most Brownian people making lives possible for those earning the salary so they could pay for their $17 million apartments in an extreme that I've never seen before. So, I what you're saying, I mean certain things, class is a nationality. Um, class, so with, with, with what's happening economically, yes, because those who can't afford to live the way you live can threaten the way you live. And this is something I fear. And this goes, that's what I'm saying. Um, we have our queer politics and our queer cultural expression, our lesbian cultural expression. But if you see the movie Pride, and I'm, it's a movie about how lesbians and gays and, and queer groups helped support the miners in the Welsh strikes during the Thatcher years, which is a story not very well known. But what grew out, when you see that movie, if it comes here, the feeling that now is the time for us to be in coalition about some of the things that she was talking about, perhaps about medical care, perhaps about affordable housing, always is out gay people, but looking in the faces of others who are facing the same displacements. Maybe we are on the verge of a brand new movement where we move, where it is not about gay rights exclusively. It is gay people marching against the privilege and abuse of power with other people, as ourselves in full, in full autonomy, but with others. So, you see, I can see a new, a new politic coming. And we, and what we demand is that what we show is, if you don't, is the respect on both sides. When I marched in Selma, I marched as a hidden lesbian. This is my, going back to 1964, because I felt. The historical moment was too big for me to mess it up with coming out as a lesbian. But five years later, in an anti-apartheid march, we marched with the Lesbian History Archives banner. And that was a real coming of political age. And no one ever asked us to get out of the march, because they needed everyone. <laughs> I'm happy to be here. I'm here in 
Gaga, my we are Belgrade uh, lesbian uh, fan club of John Esler, we had it two years ago. Yes. We traveled all day today in the bus and, and we feel happy. I want to go back to the pillow. <laughs> so do I. I mean, she kept saying pillow, pillow, because she, my friend is not so much in your speaking, so I speak for us. <laughs> pillow in the context of lesbian and her story. And then I, I had to remember one, one of many of my stories. <laughs> and, and that was in 80, um, 86, uh, 86. I was. Um, that was my first huge love story in Belgrade, that the woman was from Bolivia living in Belgrade. And one of the days, and then we didn't have a place to make love. So uh, um, I was living with my parents, and she was living with her family, with her husband and three children. <laughs> so uh, one of the days when we were walking down the town, she said, listen, I have a, a keys of my office. And she was working in the Bolivian embassy in Belgrade. <laughs> <laughs> embassy had two people and her, two men and she. And there, you know, in, that was Yugoslavia, you know, so everything closes at three or four. You know. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing to really work in Bolivian embassy at that time. Anyway, so we end up in that flat, thinking we are going to be for five minutes. You know. And then, you go, and then we uh, decided to stay all night there, but there is nothing in, in that other place. So then we get naked. There is no pillow, but uh, <laughs> this story is not about pillow, it's about how we're going to cover ourselves because we got cold. So then we start searching the, the flat to find something to cover ourselves, nothing, 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 nothing. And then I was trying very, very far away to find something in a cupboard. And then I found out a huge Bolivian flag. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic colors, it's yellow and green. And it's big <laughs> for two, perfect for two. <laughs> so I never, it's like, sorry in my history that that night we slept on the body of life and made love fun to do. So I'm thinking now, I want to go back to, to the how to make our personal story in, in, the, in, the, in, in the her story. How to support each other to write about this more and how to make it more visible, what happened in our love making. And uh, uh, also uh, how to, uh, to, well, we had war in this region, the war and homophobia, lesbophobia, also is part of this one making. We have a, a term uh, that we form in our workshops in Belgrade, you know, like it's a, it, it's a cat on the, on the roof because you start making love and then there is two, something like this and then you say, oh, something's on the door, you know, because you're so afraid that someone's going to come in your room and find you making love while it's uh, not really what you're supposed to do in the homophobic society. But it was really a cat that made this sound. So, uh, so I think it's very important to, to support each other, to, to, to speak out uh, uh, our love stories and desire stories. And so I also want to, I was so privileged to have John Nestle lead me through the Her Story archive in, in, uh, in, uh, in now it's not in Bronx, it's in Brooklyn, So I wish you say a little bit more to the people who don't know what, uh, because it, it's very famous through uh, principles, how you archive it, uh, what to do collect it at the beginning. There is also people there. <laughs> and part of, of the archive a little bit about about the archive because it, uh, so then we get some picture of people who don't know because it's really a fantastic story not only as a fact. As I said, in 1974, there was an organization called the Gay Academic Union. For better or for worse, was that I had a mother called Regina, and Regina, who sometimes was a sex worker who was beaten up by men.
mail. I wouldn't call them lovers. By men she needed. Um, who was a worker always, a bookkeeper, a self-taught bookkeeper, who was gang raped when she was 14, who had an abortion when she was 14. This is back, this is living in what was then a poor Jewish uh, working class community in Harlem at this time. It would have been around 1915, uh, 16. Um, a mother who taught me, never taught me how to brush my teeth, but taught me what the, who Paul Robeson was. Do you know, Paul Robeson was an African-American left-wing, uh, a, a man of, he was a Renaissance man who we were taught in the 50s to hate because he was a commie. And my mother taught me the truth of his wonders. Who, talk, who took me on one of her, she worked six days a week, so on Sunday she took me to see the plaque with a triangle shirt raised fire. That was the fire where something like 800 Italian and Jewish immigrant young women led to their death because the bosses had locked all the windows and the doors. And that fire, which was around like 1912 or something, gave rise to the union movement, to the textile workers, the women marching in the streets. So, and along with that were all the other parts of my mother's life. Um, I don't know if I'm answering, Tatiana, you have to tell me, but you know what, I'm gonna, as a writer to writers, I saw things as a child that children should see. And I had none of, very few of the securities that children should have. But somehow, I thought, I will look at all of this, and I will take it into my heart. I'm talk I think I was always looking with a writer's eye, even when I didn't know what a writer was. Because what I saw was a woman, an undomesticated woman. She wore no rings. My father had died suddenly when my mother was six months pregnant with me. Um, and when, so I watched a woman try to make a life when others called her whore, who embezzled money to send my brother, who was psychologically disturbed to a special school, my mother and it's all in here, you know, pitiful small sums for which she was arrested and was on, um, watched her go to the parole officer every week, watched my brother get arrested for a fake holdup. I, I went through all these things, I could tell these stories, <laughs> so, but I just saw people without money, without power, with great loneliness, trying somehow to have a life. And I have to say, without the woman lovers I have found in my life, Deborah one and I here, I wouldn't be sitting here with you. Because a writer sometime, no matter how far we can take with what our heart's eye is showing us, sometimes we need the peace of knowing we're safe to make the pages live with those stories. So my mother taught me politics. When she died, um, and I was the only one there, um, the hospital, I never got to see her body, but they gave me a little suitcase that she came come into the hospital with. And in it was a bathroom I had given her. But in that was her writings, because my mother yearned to be a writer. But she was a bookkeeper, so she wrote when she was drunk with gin and Chesterfield cigarettes. That's how my mother would write. Um, on the back of ledger sheets, old, you know, ledger sheets, old-fashioned bookkeeper sheets, she wrote letters to the world. That's how I found out she'd been gang raped. She never told me while she was alive. Um, and so her words are, are in my 
It was that, but it was also many other people. And I don't know if I'm answering the question, but you know, you know that people, you know that there's the rendering of life is all around us. And it's how we take it in, how we see it. In some sense, the McCarthy period, okay, that was a huge um, influence on my life. The McCarthy period, Joseph McCarthy, okay, I'll explain. I have seen many ugly Americans, and one of them was from 1940s to the 50s, when Joseph McCarthy, who was an anti-communist crusader, took over the American imagination. And I have, I was at a city university, I was a student, where a teacher jumped to his death because the McCarthy, the committee, the House on Americans Activities Committee, had threatened to reveal him. What I learned, I don't have time, but I've written about it, I learned from seeing how dictated hatreds, and hatreds were dictated to me from when I was 10 years old on, because that in our schools, they taught us who to hate, you know? And something, okay, I wore, oh, pouring out, <laughs> I wore uh, a key around my neck. I was what it was called a lock key child, because my mother worked and I needed to take care of myself from a very early age. So I had this key around my neck. Now, I had a very right-wing teacher in around, it would have been maybe 1948, 49, and she was one day lecturing all of us young people about the great evils in American society, and one of those great evils were lock-key children, whose parents didn't care enough about them to be at home to take care of them. And I was the only lock-key child in that room. And as she spoke, that key felt like it was on fire. So very slowly, I'm touching my Jewish tongue, very slowly I hid it. I put it inside my sweater. But this teacher just went on and on about the terrible people these parents were. And by the time she was finished, I took the key out because, and this is, it happens, believe me, it happens, because she had taught me a much deeper lesson, that she didn't have one idea of what my mother's life was like, that she had no idea what lock key children's life looked like, and I was not going to accept her version of my life because it would mean too much self-hatred. And I, so there, there come moments that teach you, they teach you, and whatever made it possible for me to survive what I had to survive, because there weren't the usual comforts in all kinds of ways, but I always think, and this is why I love writers so much, we have to see with naked eyes, and we have to live in a naked way, but then others can hold us and say, it's, it's okay, you'll do something with what you had to see. Oh, wow. Generosity and this kindness, and this is this is what I remembered at Belgrade when we met, and and we had a lovely presentation. You showed history, you showed 
photographs, you showed pictures, um, you talked about bodies, uh, uh, butch bodies, body politics in, in, a, in a very organic way. And it was, it was a life-changing experience to hear you talk about things and show things and, and not be uh, tough or bitter, but just being kind. And I was thinking, this is, I'm, I'm so glad you came. And I'm very, very, very grateful because as you said before, uh, we didn't have any budget. Uh, and and you, you said, okay, I'll come. I'll, I'll, I'll come here, I'll do it for free. I'll, I'll buy my own tickets and everything. And, and sometimes it's like, we, we felt so, so sad, we, we thought, okay, we want to have enough money so we can, you know, we can treat you to visit us, so we can treat people to this comfort, to this kindness and the knowledge that you have. And, uh, you know, because... I cried, I'm sorry. <laughs> We're making you cry first than Tiana. She started it. But it's just, it's this great amount of gratefulness and this great feeling of sisterhood. You talked about sisterhood and, and this is something, and I was thinking, this is, this is what I want to show people who weren't there in Belgrade and who haven't met you there. And I said, the feeling of sisterhood, because you said, don't, don't, if you need me for something, just ask, just call me, just everything. And I was thinking, you know, you, you've been activist for a very long time and your life hasn't been simple. It was a hard life. And yet you possess this generosity and, and sisterhood and this responsibility to the community. And I said, we, you know, said we need to bring John Nassau here. People need to hear and experience it. We just say, and then we'll stop. But you see what a gift it was to me. So if you, you see, I know that. I knew that I would walk new streets. I've never walked these new streets before. I would see new faces. I, I would be asked new things. So it's always a gift when it's always a gift. And I want to say, isn't this, this is the 30th anniversary of your movement? And what a, um, what an honor it is to be here for that and always know that saying yes brings wonders. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. My rump and falling breasts, but the cold night air demanded that the fire be encouraged to burn at a brisker pace. My younger lover, small and tight in her body, sat on the couch watching me. I did not like what I thought she saw. I did not like the bigness of my ass, the weight of my body on my knees. And then just as I worked very hard to accept my lack of appeal, she said in a low, firm voice, you look so fuckable that way. <laughs> I froze, caught in that moment of self-hatred by the clarity of her desire. I stopped all movement, awed once again by the possibilities of life. I knew she was walking toward me. I felt her stand behind me, felt her hand shape my nightgown to my curves. I heard her breath come quicker, and still I did not move. She grew impatient and reached under the gown, piling up its lengths on her arm like a fisherman pulling in his nets. And then, against all my fear, she entered me. The fire blazed up, and so did my hope, as I finally left the burden behind me and rode her hand with all the grace love had ever given me. Wow.
Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 Just perfect.